Hi, I'm Greg Staples, the sales manager for the spectroscopy products at Basebeck. I'm here at the Defense and Commercial Sensing Show in Baltimore, Maryland, 2016, and I'm here to talk about hyperspectral imaging. And I'm going to talk more of an introductory level. Uh, hyperspectral imaging is a technology that's been around for probably 50 years, but as technology has advanced, it's become a more commercial application. The side uh, used to be a very difficult technology, very large, uh, very expensive and re required a lot of computing power. And so it was really only for uh, aerospace applications, military, uh, satellites, but with the advances in detectors, with advances in UAV technology, and advances with computer technology, this is a technology that's become more readily available to many different applications. So I'd like to just briefly talk about some of the different technologies in hyperspectral imaging. What it is, is creating a hyperspectral data cube with X and Y spatial information and lambda wavelength information. And so basically you're using a two-dimensional detector to get three-dimensional information. So you need to have some way to split the third dimension up onto your detector to be able to capture all of that. So there's basically two different approaches to this. One is called push broom hyperspectral imaging where you basically capture your X dimension and your wavelength dimension uh, off the, off the two-dimensional array, and then you sweep across your field of view to gain your other Y spatial dimension. So the downside of this is your sample or your imager have to be in motion. The other uh, technology that's used is what's called snapshot hyperspectral imaging. And in that case, what you're doing is you're splitting your two-dimensional array into many different smaller arrays and getting X and Y, and in the different positions, getting your lambda information. The downside of this is it's lower resolution because you've made your 2D array much smaller. Now, the advantage of this is it's much faster than push broom. So, uh, with the push broom style as well, you have different options with how you split your, your light up spectrally. You could use filters, you could use dispersive elements like prisms or gratings, and each of those different technologies have advantages and disadvantages, and it's really dependent on what your application is. The other consideration with regards to hyperspectral imaging is what wavelength range that you want to be in. Different samples have different reflectivity properties depending on what they are. So plants, for instance, they're highly reflective in the near-infrared, say around 800 to 1,000 nanometers. In mining applications, it's typically more in the shortwave infrared, say around 1,300 nanometers to 2.5 micron. Uh, you have food inspection where visible might be enough. And so really when you're determining what type of hyperspectral imager you want, you need to know about your reflectivity properties of the materials you're looking at. Because the technology is new, it's not always well known. So in that case, what you would want to do is do some discovery, some research on your samples to determine what are the key wavelengths of interest, and then from there, you can determine what type of imager you want. There's also another technology that's very closely related to hyperspectral, which is called a multispectral imager. In this case, it's more narrow, uh, uh, less bands on the imager. So the, the camera in which we're doing this video, in fact, is a multispectral imager. It is an RGB camera. And for many applications, that is enough. But for certain applications, if you had some infrared information, you are able to distinguish properties much better. As I mentioned before, plants, for instance, very re uh, reflective in the infrared. So in, in those cases, maybe four bands are enough. Your red, your green, your blue, and an infrared. So a multispectral would be fine there. So multispectrals are typically from about four to 10 bands. And like I said, for some applications, that's more than enough. But if you need more distinguishing features, if you need more information, that's when you would go to a hyperspectral imager. So one application that's become more available to people is precision agriculture. As I mentioned before, the technology used to be very bulky and very expensive. With advances in detector technology, in UAV technology, and computer technology, everything has shrunk down to the point where they're less expensive, more compact, and much more easily used by uh, farmers, by precision agriculture companies. So this is an example of a hyperspectral imager here. It's very light, very compact, and you can mount that on a UAV, fly it over a, a field, uh, be it uh, high value crops, uh, wineries, that sort of thing, and, uh, and be able to get a lot of the information you need. And because of 
because of the advances in the technology, this system here, where uh, an imager, a computer, a battery, is less than a kilogram. It's very easy to fly on the new UAVs that are becoming more, uh, less expensive and, and easier to use in the market. Also, we have a, a system that's a handheld. So this is an example of a snapshot hyperspectral imager. It's basically a point and shoot camera. You take a picture of your image and you get your hyperspectral image, image in, instantaneously. So for food inspection, uh, for pharmaceutical inspection, it's, it's a very powerful tool. So in summary, when choosing uh, an imager, be it multispectral or hyperspectral, you need to know uh, how many bands that you want to look at, what wavelength range that you want to look at, and uh, also what resolution. And that is really going to uh, drive the selection of which technology. And if you need assistance with determining that, we at Basebeck are always happy to help. Thank you.